Does God Exist? Are Science and Faith Enemies? Your host for this series was an atheist who became a believer in God through his studies in science. Here is public high school teacher John Clayton. Anytime you get involved in a discussion about the biblical record, one of the immediate concerns that comes up is the question of what about the evolution of man? What about the evidence that is presented in series like the Time Life series back in the 70s, in which there was a sequence shown from Pliopithecus, a little tiny monkey-like guy, to modern man. And the question is not so much the question of whether man can change or not, but the question of whether all this process happens by chance, and whether there's any possible misunderstanding about the nature of that kind of a sequence. So what we'd like to do is to talk a little bit about what the evidence is and try to get a little better understanding of what some of the features are and then talk about what really is happening and the question about the history of man and the kind of thing that is presented by scientists, not the media, and by the kind of thing that the Bible really says, not perhaps what people say the Bible says. I'd like to emphasize that the Time Life situation was a media presentation. And most of the things that have been spun off of it are media presentations. And there are some major difficulties that are involved in this presentation. And the first problem that we get into is the, is the question of what is man? And this ultimately will be where we end up in this discussion. You remember back earlier, we talked about man as a being created in the image of God. And we talked about what that means that man is not predominantly an instinctively driven robot, but that in fact he has intellect, that he has creative capacity, that he has a willingness to die for ideas, or that he has a characteristic which enables him to express himself in music and art and worship. We talked about Jesus Christ and the demonstrations that we have that we possess personality, that we can experience guilt, sympathy, forgiveness, which is not generally seen in other living things. And our conclusion of that discussion is that the definition of man is that man is that being which is created in the image of God. He possesses characteristics which are not a part of his intelligence, not a part of the fact that some kind of chance process that has occurred, but because we in fact are uniquely and specially created in the image of God as the Bible says. So this is a definition, but there are other definitions. For instance, here is a definition, which is really a list of characteristics. If you look at this skull that I have in my hand, what you see is that there are certain characteristics that you can determine about this skull. You can see that it has a rounded top. You can see that there are very small superorbital ridges, the ridges above the eyes. You can notice that the opening into the skull, which is called the foramen magnum, is located geometrically in the center of the skull, which means that this individual was an erect postured individual, and that the spinal column came into the brain from the center, so he didn't need a big neck muscle back here to hold his head up. So this skull would be fairly easy to identify. This is a German Shepherd. Looks different, doesn't it? You can see that the eye structure is very different. You can see there's a very definite promathicism, which we didn't see in the human skull. We also see that the opening into the skull, the foramen magnum, in this case would come in from the back. So this individual would have needed a big neck muscle to hold his head up. That's what the hump is on the neck of the German shepherd before he tears your leg off. So there are a number of criteria that are used to differentiate between the German shepherd and man. But notice that these are all physical criteria. Now let's go back and let's look at our list of characteristics that define man. It has to do with the brain size. It has to do with such things as what the shape of the skull is. It has to do with the superorbital ridges. It has to do with the forehead. It has to do with the question of what is true of the opening into the skull. Now, if you look at a skull like this, what you'll notice is that there's a huge ridge on the top of the skull. And what that huge ridge allows is muscles to be attached to the lower jaw to give this animal a better bite. Now, a human might have a ridge, you know, if the, if the, if the skull 
sections came together during a baby's development and ridged it up. He might have a little ridge on his skull. You might put your hand across the top of your skull and feel a little bump up there, but that's not the kind of ridge that you see when you're looking at an ape. So this distinguishes an ape from man. You might also realize that the shape of the human skull is very, very characteristic. Whereas in an ape, instead of having the rounded back of the skull, the rounded occipital that you see in this specimen, in an ape it would be a sharply pointed one. And the dental pattern is another interesting characteristic. Man's pattern is two, one, two, three. So there are two corn on the cob type teeth, if you will, one dagger shaped tooth, canine, two premolars, and three molars. Now, if you were looking at a monkey, you would see a very different type of tooth structure, not only in the number of teeth, but in the shapes between the cusps. And so the result of that is that the tooth structure of a monkey and an ape and a man are different just looking at the top. Now, one question that always comes up in this type of discussion is, well, don't you have variations that could make that unreliable? And the answer is, yeah, that's true. As a matter of fact, not everybody has a 2123 tooth pattern. Dentists will tell you that many children today don't get wisdom teeth at all. That, in fact, the pattern for that individual would not be 2123. So, yes, there can be variations. But nevertheless, the criteria are fairly generally used based upon physical criteria that are seen in the specimens that are found. And so this is one of the difficulties in discussions of this type is the fact that the definition of man is very different. The anthropological definition depends solely upon physical criteria, whereas the biblical definition depends upon spiritual criteria. And so I view you as a being uniquely created in the image of God. And I'm not overly concerned about your tooth pattern or the number of cusps you have or what the shape between them is or any of those things. And this isn't to say that those aren't useful criteria or that there's anything wrong with physical anthropologists using them, but it's to say the criteria are very different. So the first point is there is a definition of man issue. A second problem is that sometimes we get into difficulties with the amount of evidence present <laughs> and with vested interest <laughs> in what that evidence suggests. Now this is a bone spray for a, a specimen known as Lucy. Lucy is one of those individuals that at least some people think might be some kind of a link. And one of the things that's interesting here is to look at the criteria and ask, if you, if you didn't have any prejudice at all, if you didn't have any preconceived notions at all, what would you assume this specimen came from? When I taught earth science at the high school level, one of the things I used to do is to go through a very simple discussion of anthropology with my students. What characteristics physically define a human as opposed to a monkey as opposed, for instance, to an ape? Well, one thing is cranial capacity. How big is the brain? In a chimpanzee, the average probably is around 500, 525, I think my book says. In a gorilla, you're talking 735. In a human, 1400 is probably an average, 1470 I've seen in some books. What do you get when you look at Lucy? 421 cc's. Now, is that human? Is that ape or is that monkey? Well, I'd, I'd say we chalk one up for the monkey, very small brain. Well, how about the mandible, the lower jaw? In a human being, the mandible is C-shaped. If I make a C out of my hand and go like this, it fits pretty well. In an ape, it's box-shaped. And in a monkey, it's V-shaped. What do you have here? Well, you can take your fingers and go up to the TV screen and you can put your fingers on there. It's a perfect V-shape. Two for the monkey. How about the ratio of bones, which has something to do with posture? In a human being, the ratio between the femur, which is the upper leg bone, and the humerus, which is the upper arm bone, is roughly two to one. My femur, my upper leg bone, is roughly twice as big as my upper arm bone. Now, in a monkey, they're pretty much the same size. And in an ape, it might be somewhere in between. What do we got here? You can come up to the screen, you can freeze your picture if you want to do this and, and just measure the two, you'll see they're essentially the same size. Now some of this at this point may be saying, well, I don't understand how, 
why is this even presented then as, as some kind of a link? What, why would anybody think that this is sort of an intermediary? Well, it has to do with various anthropological models. And the gentleman that first suggested this, or first found this, and suggested it has some kind of a connection, has a belief, has a theory, that what happened in the development of man was that apes became erect first, and then brain size increased to turn these specimens into humans. There are others that say, no, the brain sign happened for first, they got big brains first, and then, then they became erect as it gave them an advantage over their competitors in the environment. And so, if you find a specimen where erect posture is indicated, it might be an answer to this question. So in this particular case, when Johansson looked at the, the sacrum, which is at the bottom of your picture, and at the hip, it looked to him like they went together vertically. Now there are some people that are questioning the sacrum, and you, you can get into all kinds of issues here connected with the actual find and the way in which the find was dated and all those types of things. But all I'm trying to get you to see here is that this is a physical question. And it is based upon some assumptions about it. It certainly is not a link. And whether you talk about a human or an ape or a monkey, there are some very easy anthropological criteria which help you in answering that kind of question. How much evidence do we have? I think very few people are aware of just how much of a problem it is to come up with a workable model when you're dealing with the kind of fragmentary evidence that is available. Now in 1974, when the first time life chart was spread out and, and received its, all of its attention, and numerous television shows, everything from Planet of the Apes to Saturday morning cartoons were based upon it, the specimens that they chose in the time life chart were Plyopithecus procancel, Dryopithecus, Oreopithecus, Ramopithecus, going down the left-hand side of this chart. And what we've done is go back to the anthropological tables and just look up how much evidence was available for each of those specimens. The number of skulls, the number of jaws, the number of teeth, the number of pelvises, vertebrae, and so forth. And as you can see, until you get down to Neanderthalensis, you don't have complete skeletons. In the case of the Australopithecines, you have enough fragments to make many complete skeletons, but they're not all from the same individual. Now there's an important issue here that has to be recognized when the evidence is so fragmentary and so widely distributed. And anthropologists are faced with huge problems in attempting to answer these kinds of questions. And let me just show you the kind of difficulty you have. This is a copy of a drawing, an artist drew this, of a specimen known as Plyopithecus. In the time life chart, they have a picture of Plyopithecus. It looks like, it's very much like this. And you'll see other specimens that look like this. And, and let me just poke a little fun at this for a minute to try and get you to think about what's going on. What can you really tell about this individual based upon the evidence that is available? We're going to split screen for you a fossil with this specimen so you can make a comparison. Here you have some bones. What could you say from these bones? Well, there's some things you could say. You could measure these bones and you might get a guesstimate as to how big this specimen was. It might be that there would be some tests that you could make that would indicate something about the sex of the individual. What could you not say that is in the reconstruction. You'll notice that in the reconstruction that he's drawn wearing a beautiful fur coat. What can you tell about how much fur this individual had based upon the bones that you see on this chart? What could you say about it? Did he have a lot of fur? No fur at all. Was he an ugly hairy guy or was he beautiful like me? Bald. Well, <laughs> obviously you can't tell, can you? What can you tell about the nature of the soft tissue. Did he have great big huge floppy ears? Or did he have very small ears? Did he have huge extended lips? Or did he have very small lips? How about his nose? Did he have a cute little button type of nose like you see here in Plyopithecus? Or did he have a nose that looks like this? 
Now, this is a specimen known as a proboscis monkey. This is a modern monkey. But the soft tissue is something you would never guess if you were looking at the bones of this animal. You're never going to see a petrified nose. And the point that needs to be understood here is that when you've got bones, you don't have any idea what the soft tissue looks like. And it's important to understand that sometimes when charts like this are shown, enormous artistic license is taken. Now here you have four specimens. I'd like for you to notice something in the second one from the right. And you'll see this in many charts, including the time life chart. Notice the detail in this specimen. I mean, he had a, a huge amount of promathicism. His mouth's way out in front of his face. Huge nose. That guy could smell a McDonald's hamburger three miles away. And notice the muscles. Man, alive. That guy, he'd have been great on World Wrestling Federation stuff. And monstrous leg development. But what I really want you to look at is look at his left leg. And notice the toe. He has what is called a brachiated toe. In other words, if you look at my hand here, you'll notice my hand has a thumb, which is at right angles, essentially, to the rest of my hand. So my hand is made so that I can grab a hold of things. This guy had a foot like that. He could grab a hold of the tree limb with his feet, and then left his hands free to fight with. Do you know how much evidence the time life people had for the specimen they do that, they, that looks like this? Do you know how many fossils the artist was actually looking at when he made that drawing? One single tooth. One tooth. Now, how are you going to tell something about a toe from a tooth? And it's important to understand this isn't a scientific mistake. This isn't something some evolutionist did to mislead people. This is a media thing. And it's important to understand that when we look at reconstructions, an artist has to take license because he doesn't have enough to work with to give him any significant evidence. When you're looking at animals that existed so far back where we don't have dehydrated specimens or other specimens that can be found. So there are enormous problems in the integrity of reconstructions and the incompleteness of the record is greatly exaggerated. There's no question when you get to Neanderthalensis what the specimen looked like. And, uh, and in recent years, there's clearly been change in man. But this raises another issue. And then what about the time sequences? Now we've already talked about the fact that the Bible does not address the question of time. But what I've done here is to take a chart of claims that have been made and a lot of this was in the time life material, but in numerous presentations since that, for a list of specimens. And as you look at the bar graphs here, which indicate the range over which the specimens are found, notice that Ramapithecus, the fifth one in this list, is actually older than the four above it. And when you look at time charts, and this is, a, again, an artistic drawing of these, You'll see Ramapithecus in the fifth position, or in the fourth position, when he actually belongs in the second position. This is another one of those media things where specimens have been deliberately put out of order because it fitted their model better. And they're attempting to convey something that supports their point of view. So there's problems with reconstructions. This is just the nature of the game. There's also a problem with something called converging evolution. And many people don't understand the fact that sometimes connections can appear to be there when they're not there. People will say, well, I, I've had kids ask me sometime, well, if Billy didn't come from an ape, how come he looks so much like one? Well, you know, there's an answer for that. You're looking at a dorsal fin here. What is it? Well, you might say, well, that's a shark. Well, it could be a shark. But there are other animals it could be. When I was in Florida one time hunting conch shells, I got rammed by a porpoise that looked just like this because I was too close to her baby. And at least with my lack of knowledge of what those specimens looked like, all I saw was this dorsal fin coming at me, and abject fear took me over, and I tried to run when I was waist deep in water, which you can't do, by the way. But the important thing to understand about this is that here we have a porpoise has a certain set of characteristics, including a dorsal fin, including a tail. And here we have a shark, which also has a dorsal fin. Why do they look so much alike? Converging evolution says 
that animals will have the same characteristics if they share a common environment, that certain organs or certain functional structures will be present in an animal if it is a survival advantage in the environment in which he has been found. A dorsal fin has specific advantages for creatures living in the sea, and so many, many fish have them, including porpoises and sharks. Now, nobody would suggest that porpoises evolve from sharks. The porpoise is an advanced mammal. The shark is a primitive fish. Nobody connects them, but they share common equipment. Have you ever seen a flamingo? It's a bird. You see them in Florida, you know, they get the big long necks and they strain stuff out of the water. They have a mouth that's full of a structure that strains food out of the water as they cycle it through. And a whale has the same structure and looks very much the same if all you were looking at is the mouth structure and you reduced them to the same size. Yeah, humans and apes may look somewhat alike. Why? Well, they both need stereoscopic vision to live in the kind of environment in which they live. In order to tell what's good to eat and what isn't, you need flavor. Flavor is a combination of what you smell and what you taste, so the nose needs to be close to the mouth. Now, if you're not using the nose to establish flavor, then the nose doesn't need to be near the mouth, which it isn't in many living things. The point is, yeah, we look alike because of converging evolution, because there are things that we share in terms of environment. Another problem with the time-life material is race. I used to try and get my kids to think about race in a better way. And what I would do is I'd find two kids that had earlobes that looked like this. And I would say, okay, how come we got two different races here? One race characteristic by having no earlobes, and I always accused that race of being an inferior race, and one race that had great big beautiful earlobes. Now, let me turn my head here and you look at my ear and maybe you can tell why I said that. See, I have big, beautiful, well-developed earlobes. So when trying to get my kids to think, I sort of kidded them about, you know, if you've got big, beautiful earlobes like me, you must be a superior race. And if you don't have any earlobes, you're an inferior race. And most of them had no earlobes, so it got all kinds of interesting things started. But sooner or later, someone would say, well, that's not race. Race is skin color. Really? Where we get that idea? See, it's a lot easier to look at somebody 25 feet away and say, don't move in my neighborhood, than it is to go up to somebody and look at their earlobe before we make that kind of prejudicial statement. So as a matter of convenience, we have chosen skin color as the basis of racial prejudice. But the fact of the matter is that the same thing that causes me to have big earlobes and somebody else to have none makes the black man black and the white man white. Because the races are an adaption, an evolutionary adaption, if you will, to different climatic situations. If you make a cross-section of a black man's skin, what you will see is that under the outer layer of skin, he has a collection of a material known as melanin. Now, melanin is the material that gives him his beautiful dark color, but what you might not know about melanin is that it is an excellent absorber of ultraviolet radiation. So when the damaging rays of the sun fall upon his skin, they don't penetrate into the metabolism. So there's a much lower probability of sunstroke, vitamin D poisoning, and so forth, as well as, incidentally, a capacity to release heat faster. Now, if you make the same cross-section of a white man's skin, you'll see there's a much lower concentration of melanin, which means the probability of sunstroke in a place where you have eye incoming radiation is much, much higher. Now, let's go to Africa for a minute. What color of skin do people have in equatorial areas of Africa or South America? Well, that's pretty obvious, isn't it? Any reason for that? You got a white man and a black man out in the noonday sun digging a ditch. The sun is right straight overhead, beating down with all of its intensity. Who's going to survive? <laughs> it's going to be the white man. And so there is a distinct advantage to the increased melanin concentration in equatorial areas. Now, as you move from equatorial Africa to northern Africa, as you come up further and further north, get up into Palestine, up into Lebanon, up into Greece, up into Spain, move on up into Germany, France, Norway, Denmark, Sweden, what's happening? The skin color is getting lighter. 
The eye color is getting bluer. The hair color is getting blonder. It is obviously an adaption to latitude. And the only place we see exception to that are in places like the Eskimo, where even then there's an adaption to the local climate. My one-liner here is that God did not just equip man to live wherever you live. God equipped man to live anywhere on the earth, and what is useful in one place is not necessarily useful somewhere else. But in charts like this, there is a great failure to pay attention to racial variation. And individuals like these are present around us today. There is enormous range of variation in racial characteristics. Compare an aborigine to a Swede, and you're going to see huge differences. But what we see in the past is not these kinds of minor changes. And a failure to recognize racial characteristics is one of the difficulties that permeates discussions of this type. Man is uniquely and specially created in the image of God. And that brings us to the most important point about the separation between man and other living things. The real answer to the question of man, caveman, and God. You want to see a caveman? Go get your buddy to sit in a cave and look at him. A caveman is a man living in a cave. That's all. But the fact still remains that uniqueness of man, spiritually, is the message of the Bible. And all of the anthropological evidence, which has fraught with problems, has to deal with how we have adapted physically to a changing world. And it's important to understand that that uniqueness which sets man apart, the fact that we are created in the image of God, is the message that the Bible brings. And whatever we may understand about how man has developed and changed racially, how we have varied to fit environments that take us from the north slopes to equatorial sections of the world is not the issue. You are a human being, uniquely and specially created in the image of God. That gives you intrinsic inherent worth. And whatever physical anthropology may learn about how we have modified and changed to fit a changing earth will not change that basic fact that we are uniquely and specially in the image of God. Does God Exist is an educational program which attempts to provide evidence that man can logically believe in God and that the Christian system presented in the New Testament is the best option for successful living. We offer materials free and on loan. Contact us by mail, fax, or email for a catalog to request materials or just to ask questions. Does God Exist may be the most important question you will ever ask.